Good evening and welcome. I'm Linda Frisco, president of the Friends of the Maine State Museum. I'm delighted that so many of you um, are joining our first annual meeting uh, via Zoom, uh, featuring a very special addition uh, to the museum's collection. We are very grateful for your continued interest and enthusiasm in learning about the museum activities while the museum is closed. Your donations and memberships allow the friends to create opportunities um, to keep you informed as to what is going on behind the scenes. So thank you uh, for being here, not only for the uh, friends, um, but for the museum as well. So I can't say it enough. Thank you, thank you. And now I would like to introduce um, Amy Waterman, who is the uh, membership director of development and um, for the friends. So Amy. Thanks, Linda. Um, hi again, and welcome again. Um, as Linda just mentioned, as I'm sure the majority of you are well aware, uh, the museum has had to close its doors for an extended period of time for a major multi-layered um, construction project. And so we've missed seeing visitors around the place and it's really nice to see all of you, all of your faces. Um, and exciting when you join us for these kinds of online programs or those that um, are offered by the museum's education department. And I'm going to um, shortly put into our, our chat function a few links that I think um, might interest you that will lead you to some interesting videos, to some activities for um, families and young people, um, and a page where you can join the friends or make a donation if you're so inclined. Um, I just wanted to um, double check that everybody should um, put themselves on mute, which um, the setting is down on the lower left of your screen. Um, if you want to adjust the speaker view, because we want to give sort of full attention to our presenters, um, you can adjust those settings usually in the upper right corner. Um, you have the options for who you want to be mainly seeing. Um, our program will have two main sections. As Linda mentioned, we're going to focus on a very special book um, that was recently acquired by the museum. And in our second section, museum director Bernard Fishman will catch us all up on what is happening at the museum and some exciting plans for the future. Um, I think those are the main things you need to know. If you have questions for our presenters, and we hope you will, we're going to ask you to put them into the chat box, also down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, actually, uh, it may be where the three dots say more. You can activate your, your chat and type something into the, the lower part of that screen because we'd love to hear from you and I'll, I'll field those questions a bit later. Um, but to get us started, uh, to get down to business and launch our look at this amazing book and start thinking about some remarkable Maine women, I'm going to introduce our terrific and talented archivist, Zach Selly, and he'll introduce other special guests. Thank you very much. Um, I am excited to be here today at the Friends Meeting to um, talk about this exciting gift um, made possible by members of the Critique Group from the University of Southern Maine, Kate Shenny Chappelle Center for Book Arts. I hope that's the only time I have to say that giant title. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can see the book and what we're talking about. And so now you should all see the slides. Yes, perfect. Um, with us today, we actually have several members of the uh, group who worked on the book who are going to talk about the book itself, their work, and kind of book arts in Maine in general. 
Um, when this item crossed my path as an acquisition, I was really interested to know more about um, the book itself, but also the artist who made it, because it really crossed uh, two different scopes of interest of mine, um, both, you know, Maine and history and this book that honors, you know, remarkable Maine women of both past and present, but because of my own history working in book arts and uh, printing programs. And as such, I was really delighted to see this new work, uh, you know, come to light that really brought those two aspects together so well. Um, the book itself is called Remarkable Maine Women. It was published in 2019 in addition of five copies, and the Maine State Museum is proud to be one of the local and national archives and museums to receive this gift. Um, since we're all on Zoom and can't be here to enjoy the book in person, I wanted to attempt to put into perspective the scope, artistry, craftsmanship, and, and actual sheer size of this book as we got started. And you can see from the, the photos, it's, it's kind of a, a, a complicated book to begin with. Um, it's bound in an accordion format with um, paper covers, calligraphy title, it has a tipped in uh, colophon in front of this piece. And then the core of it is 15 individually inserted Turkish map folds that were created by different members of the group representing the 15 different remarkable Maine women honorees. Uh, when fully extended, this book is over seven and a half feet long. Um, but when folded up, it's like five inches wide by three inches deep. So, you know, it just, it's just this, this amazing, you know, kind of piece of art and uh, uh, ingenuity, you know, within it. Uh, in regards to preparing the book, I did want to quote from the artist themselves collaborative statement, uh, which I thought was, was very well articulated, um, which says, the individual, the individual pages allowed each artist to express her personal vision, which were then joined together in a unified and expanding accordion. The result is an enticing three-dimensional work of art that gradually draws the reader in for a deeper look. Um, and it certainly does. You know, within each page, um, there is a new story found, new creative world is explored, and a new life is seen. Um, within that, there's an, a wonderful assortment of mixed artistic mediums that are incorporated, including watercolor, collage, and printing. And while you can get a sense of the complexity of this book from these images, you know, really, when you when you get to sit down and look at it, look at it and unfold it, there really is just so much more to discover in person. Um, after meeting uh, the several of the members from the group and reaching out to them about um, the book itself, um, I inquired if there was other material that they might be able to donate that complemented um, their work and the creative process of making the book. And fortunately enough, um, several of the, the 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 creators donated additional material which included uh, early drafts, sketches, tools that they used uh, to make their sections of the book. And then here you can see a sample of that additional material, including designs and tools by Libby Barrett and Susan Moda um, that they used when they developed their pages for Cordelia Stanwood and Dollop Ipcar. And if I change the page, um, and then here you can see donations by Sissy Buck and Sue Rogers, used in their work on Deb Sewell and Sarah Orn-Jewett. Uh, so it was really nice to be able to have all this some supportive information which really illustrates their works as artists living in Maine and then their work on the book. So it was a, an addition that was uh, well received. Um, I do wanna take a moment and let's go back and acknowledge all of the artists who worked to make this book possible. And of course their Maine women honorees of past and present uh, when I was watching people log into the event tonight, I saw a lot of the uh, names of the other artists who contributed to the book um, are in attendance. So it's, it's really nice that they're here to um, support this event, but also, you know, see the, 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 the fruits of their labor kind of be celebrated in this way. Um, but with that, I want to really kind of turn attention to the, the artists that are here to, to speak about their parts and welcome uh, four women uh, uh, who worked on the book um, that we have in attendance to, to kind of talk about their work. Um, Anna Lowe, Sissy Buck, Kathleen Bender, and Sue Rogers. And uh, I would like to ask them to unmic themselves now so, so they can join in the conversation. And I'm gonna start off with a quick question. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the USM Book Arts Program or the Critique Group, um, if one of you could jump in and just tell everybody a little bit about your group's history, your mission, uh, you know, what you do. I can do that. 
um, the Kate Cheney Chapel Center for Book Art, a mouthful. Critique Group is a collection of about 20 artists. We've been working together for 12 years. Um, we meet monthly, we critique each other's work, uh, we inspire each other. Every year we have several exhibits that we mount. Um, there's one up now in the Glickman Library at the University of Southern Maine Portland campus. In April, we have a show opening at the Portland Public Library. Um, and every year we try to do some collaborative book together. So that's us in a nutshell. Good. And then for the Remarkable Maine Women book, um, if you could just tell us, you know, when and how did the idea first present itself? Oh, gosh. Anna, do you want I'm to? No, I'm going to, Sissy, I'm going to throw that to you. Oh, Sissy. Hi. Um, well, in 2018, 2019, we started thinking about the, um, the bicentennial of Maine and the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And um, seeing as we are a group of all women artists, we decided to do a book to celebrate those two events. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've done some some books since then, right? Some some collaborative books have emerged since the Remarkable Maine Women. Yeah, um, we we have been meeting um, virtually for the past almost two years, and um, the most recent book that we collaborated on is an exquisite corpse book, okay. and. Um, that was done. Um, everybody did a, a, a page. Well, it, let me just back up here. So this is a book right here. But um, if you don't know what it is, it is um, a book that is divided into three to four sections. And um, it is a, we decided to do this because we were all on the screen and we wondered, okay, we see everybody's heads. What does the rest of your body look like? What are you wearing? So this um, was just kind of a fun book. Everybody designed a figure with uh, the head, the body, the torso, legs, and feet. And with each turn of each section, you can create a different figure that it's fun and um, entertaining. And uh, so anyway, that was our latest um, collaborative book. And so, yeah, so I'll, always being creative. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess going, going back to the, the Remarkable Maine Women book really quick, and I just have this, this question that kind of keeps, you know, something on my head. So whose idea was it to come up with the, the Turkish fold as the primary structure? And were there other ideas that were attempted but abandoned? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> Okay, I think it might have been me. <laughs> I'm not positive, but I recall bringing in a church full accordion book that I had while we were having that discussion. If either any of you disagree with this memory, because it's been a really long time ago now. Okay. What are the I know in the supplemental you? material that you gave, there's there's a lot of early examples and samples of, of the Turkish fold sort of taking shape in different sizes and mm -hmm. growing and shrinking. So you can kind of see that process was sort of working itself out as you were, you know, conceptualizing the, the final, you know, artistic piece. Um, yes, I will say one thing about the way we work together as a group. It's so collaborative, it would be, it, it's really hard to kind of remember exactly who did what and who said what. We have so many discussions and uh, until we come to agreement of what we're gonna to do together. We've made a number of these collaborative books in the past and there's always a, a large um, precursor of, before we start making of uh, spending a lot of time trying to get everybody's best ideas and then settle on one format. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> I know we do have a question in the chat on what exactly is a Turkish fold, um, which may be hard to explain without showing. Um, I can actually share. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she yeah. has one. She has one. Oh, there you go. If you can see Sissy Buck, um, you can see how it sort of collapses in and closes like a almost like a flower. Right. So it it it's um, this is it's started off with a nine by nine inch square that is then folded and it folds into a about a five inch square and then each each artist's Turkish map fold was put in in another piece of paper that and each page was joined as an accordion book. So when you open the accordions, it pops. It pops out. Okay. Why don't we take a few minutes and have each of you talk about your sections um, and uh, the, the remarkable main women that you chose as your subjects and I can show uh, an image of your section while you talk about it. So people might be able to understand it a little bit more in that context too. So I'll share my screen again, and then uh, whoever wants to go first, just let me know. I'll go. And whose voice was that? Th that was me, Anna. Okay, and uh, that will, you're perfect, you're up. <laughs> Great. Um, so this was my page, my Turkish map fold that's in the collaborative book. Um, it was, it's about Edna St. Vincent Millay, who I discovered when I moved to Maine um, and her poetry just really speaks to me and how it talks about nature and humanity. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of hers. And this, um, this is a digital print. Because we made five of these, um, I designed this, I drew, designed it and collaged in my own photography on the computer and then printed it out in a digital print. Very pretty. I was a big fan, um, Edna St. Vincent Millay's uh, uh, translations of Baudelaire. Oh, so it was, that was my early introduction to her. So, um, let's see, who do we have next? Um, Sissy, do you want to talk a bit more about your? Sure. sure. Hi. Um, let's see. I I thought it would be really great to actually choose a woman who was alive, a remarkable Maine woman, so I could talk with her, possibly meet her. And um, so about, um, I first learned of my remarkable woman, Deb Sewell, um, about 20 years ago when my daughter was very interested in learning more about medicinal herbs. And I've been using um, tinctures, remedies, salves, um, made by Deb Sewell up at v Avena Botanical Gardens and Apothecary. Um, so Deb Sewell is an herbalist, biodynamic gardener, teacher, and author of two books, The Woman's Handbook of Healing Herbs and How to Move Like a Gardener. Um, when we decided to do this book, it was, it was about winter time. So I just thought, well, I'm going to pick up the phone and try calling Deb. And lo and behold, she answered the phone because it's winter time, it was winter time and she had a little bit of downtime um, before, you know, gardening in the, in the spring and summer. So I um, had a great conversation with her on the phone. She, as a teacher, she is generous with sharing her knowledge and that is um, an understatement. She um, suggested since we're, since this book is about remarkable women, um, to focus on four um, plants that support women's health. And those are um, black cohosh, motherwort, hawthorn, and rosa ragosa. Um, 
And so she had invited me to come up to the gardens in the summertime, which I did. And it was just wonderful. It was um, the hawthorn trees are the hedgerow that surrounds the garden and you enter and it's a peaceful paradise and there are pollinators buzzing. And I was able to stay for most of the day sketching those four plants. I think that's great. And I, I, I really like to see, you know, when I first saw the book that there was, there was living, you know, current contemporary women represented in it as well. Mm, thanks. Uh, so it was, yeah, was, she's quite, quite an inspiration. And um, I learned a lot more than I ever imagined about um, what she does up there in reading her books. And um, the hummingbird is her favorite pollinator. Um, and Rosa Ragoza is one of her favorite um, plants to, um, it smells great, it's beautiful colors, it opens your heart um, as a tincture. And um, I did, um, I also do, um, I've been learning about eco prints or contact prints using uh, plant material to transfer onto paper mm -hmm. in a, um, in a, it's an interesting way of uh, taking plant material, bundling it in into paper, putting in a pot of boiling water, and over time, maybe forty minutes to a couple of hours, that the plant material transfers to the paper and makes you can see the petals or the leaves. And so that was the base of my page, and um, and then I drew the um, plants and then used watercolors to fill in. Okay. And as you can see, I have two um, pop-ups, the hummingbird and the Rosa Ragosa petals. That's beautiful. Yeah, and you were, you were one of the artists that, you know, really contributed a, a substantial amount of your, your early drafts and, and sketches and, and watercolors along with it, which, which is nice. Um, let's see. Let's trying to keep uh, my eye on the clock too. So um, let's move on. So Kathleen Bender, you're here. Hi everyone. I, um, I chose Louise Nevelson. I think my second thought was those eyelashes. How does she do it? So um, we, the paper that we used, uh, Canson Me Tint is very workable. And uh, so we all chose colors that remarkably all went together. Louise primarily did installation work out of wood in either black, white, or gold. So I went with the gold paper. Um, you can see on the black section, the upper section, I did a pop-up with layers that simulated the kind of um, work that she does. I knew that there was a um, piece that Port, the Portland Museum of Art owns. So I spent a lot of time just, um, just gazing at that and imagining what it was like for Louise to put her, um, the architectural remnants, the debris, the found furniture to uh, assemble it together. And I actually found out that she um, studied voice her whole life, but she also, uh, would come up with verse. So what you're seeing is a quote of hers, the self of you, the self of me, who cares about one, two, or three, the self of you, the self of me. So she was um, clearly a one of a kind. I read several books about her. Um, synchronistically, I happened to go to the main museum um, the Jewish Museum and ask uh, the curator if any one of the family uh, was still in Maine. And she said that in fact, um, there were, and then I, I was going to an artist talk. So the artist began speaking. And the next thing I know is that I get a tap on the shoulder and this woman says, you know, hi, my name is Elaine. I'm Louise's cousin. So I got to meet her cousin and um, Louise Devilson had been installed in their um, sort of honor society. And Elaine had 
lend a print that Louise had done um, for the duration of the, um, the exhibit that went along with the installation. So I felt like I got a bonus that she's um, in a family way, you know, still uh, very much living in Maine. She was, as I said, she was clearly one of a kind. She did so much for women. She did so much for art and she just kept working, didn't take no for an answer. I don't think she had a show um, before she was in her 50s. So she is quite remarkable. I agree. I, I hadn't been familiar with her until the book. And then after looking her up and, you know, kind of reading about her, her family's immigration from, from Ukraine, um, you know, in 1904 or whatever it was, um, it was just, yeah, it's really a remarkable story. And you know, I, was, I was happy to find her in there and learn more about her that way. And then last, I believe we have Sue Rogers, um, who's gonna talk about her section on Sarah Orne Jewett. Sarah Orne Jewett, she Orne -Jewett. Um, is a woman who grew up in South Berwick, Maine. And I had read long, a long time ago, The Country of the Pointed Furs, which was published in uh, 1896. And it tells the story of a young woman and the summer she spends along the main coast and the people and the habits and the dialect of the place. Um, that's a, a masterpiece that I highly recommend it. And I read it again um, not too long ago before we started this project. But I, I became particularly interested in her life after visiting this Sarah Orne Jewett uh, House Museum in South Berwick. It's a, um, which is a, I highly recommend visiting this uh, house museum. It's unusual, I thought, in the way that you really get a sense of the person who lived there because it's a very intimate house with, you know, surrounded by her own things in many cases and her surroundings. And um, that really piqued my interest in knowing more about her. And, this happened before we started our collaborative book, actually. Um, and I found out she had published her first short story in the Atlantic Monthly when she was only 19 years old. Um, at that point, she spent a lot of time um, as a, a young person going around with her fa father, who was a country doctor. And um, I think she may have done this more than she actually went to school, I'm not sure. but. She became um, a, a influential writer as a regionalist who, whose works were full of local color and who was portraying really, really accurately um, the Maine's people and landscapes. Um, although she grew up in the house that I visited or uh, spent a great deal of her life there uh, in South Berwick, she also, as an adult, um, lived part-time in Boston with um, a woman named Annie Fields, and they were friends there with Henry James and Harriet Beecher Stowe and Celia Thaxter and John Greenleaf Whittier and Longfellow, amongst others. But in all of her writing, she, her topic was always the people of Maine. And because she became very well known as a, a regionalist uh, and a of, and a writer of, of local people. I, I believe if I can't recall, I'm not sure exactly when, but later in her life, she, she was a mentor to Eudora Welty and other people who wrote similarly. That's a Sarah's story. So when I was working on my page, I'm just going to look at it. I was um, trying to take that map fold structure and sort of put imagery into the structure of the fold. So those different work in progress that I sent along to you had to do with my trying to figure out how to use the, the folds, the 3D uh, design of that folded piece of paper to um, you know, be able to display everything I wanted to. And um, I did make these two little books that are pop-ups 
Uh, one is a little story of Sarah's life and work. And the other one is a list of references of books I read and, and um, uh, sources that I used to learn more about her. And then I also referenced uh, the country of um, the uh, pointed firs and her most famous short story, which was called A White Heron. Also, when I was looking at her books, it's just one more thing. I realized that her books, I saw real copies of her books that were, you know, old. And I, I began to look at these covers and I was like, these books were all designed by the same person. It was just so obvious. And that led me to um, find out who that was and led me to learn more about her friend, uh, Sarah Wyman Whitman, who was one of the most successful women book cover designers of the time. She also designed stained glass and other things. So in my writing and the little covers of these books and everything, I was kind of like uh, being inspired by Sarah and Jewett's friend, Sarah Wyman Whitman. And that's about all I can say. I um, really enjoyed that's doing it. Oh, and yeah, we enjoy we enjoy having it, looking at it. And as a librarian, I appreciate you including your references um, in your work. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I, I think these are great. Um, I know I'm I'm trying to be hyper aware of time because I know my library or my, the museum director Bernard is, um, you know, waiting in the wings to do his presentation mm -hmm. as well. Um, so. Perhaps we should wrap this up here, unless Amy, you think there's time for questions or if any other questions came in in the chat that we should try to address. So I don't see Amy on hand. I don't see anything. I think we're good to move on then. So I wanna- Sorry, Zach, my-, my key was sticking. Um, Sorry. I think we probably have room if there is another question. And um, well, I, I was curious whether everybody in the audience had um, was familiar when they saw the, the list of all of the featured um, notable Maine women. Um, if there were some you wanted to ask about or if anyone was, was stumped by who these notables were. If not, here's another just reminder of them and you, and you can do your own research. Um, well, it is, yeah. It's quite a, a, a breadth of uh, um, different backgrounds in, in some of these women. So uh, I, I would recommend looking them all up because some of them are, are, are surprising and, and remarkable and obscure, so. And as with the Maine State Museum, they, they cover um, sort of the gamut of sort of natural history and yeah. and cultural aspects of Maine. Yeah. So and for like, us, it's, it's great because a lot of these women actually, you know, reverberate back to collections we have. You know, in some cases we have material that's related to or created by uh, some of these, some of these women, so. Nice. Well, thank you, Zach, so much. And thanks to all four of you for your beautiful work and for uh, spending this time with us. Um, Zach, you can unshare. Okay, and Maybe. I guess we now move along and uh, um, Bernard can take over. Wait, how do I unshare? Oh, stop share. There we go. Perfect. Welcome, Bernard. All right, thank you, Amy. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many of you. I also note that there are a number of commission members from the Maine State uh, Museum Commission, which is our board, as well as the board of the Friends of the Maine State Museum. Uh, there are too many to name, but I know that Mike Barrett, our chairman, is among those who are attending tonight. And I want to thank you all for being part of it. And thank, of course, the women who contributed to this remarkable book of remarkable Maine women. And I will try very briefly to sum up a year of 
uh, almost frantic activity on the part of the museum, even though things look very quiet from the outside, because as uh, most of you know, and, and I should introduce myself in case any of you don't know me, I'm Bernard Fishman, the director of the Maine State Museum. But for the past year and a half, we've been engaged in one of the largest uh, projects that the museum has ever uh, been part of. That is the renovation of actually not one, but in part three buildings that the museum's heavily engaged with, including our main building called the Cultural Building in Augusta, opposite the State House. This is the largest uh, project that the museum has has been involved with since it opened in its current location in 1971. So this is a 50 year project in terms of its size and about 70,000 square feet of museum enterprise has been affected by it. That includes our storage areas. As many of you know, this project is organized by the, um, uh, the state of Maine itself to um, improve very substantially the condition mainly of the cultural building where the museum is located, but also the state library and the state archives are located uh, for the future, but also to work on storage areas and other things. The Bureau of General Services is the Department of Main Government that's been mainly involved with us. We have, uh, through trial and error, developed a very good relationship with them and work uh, very closely and successfully now in planning this major project, uh, which is under the uh, general supervision of wood architects out of Portland. And what the project is supposed to do, as many of you know, is to abate all of the asbestos that was put into the museum when the building was built in the late 1960s to completely replace the HVAC system, uh, heating and cooling and humidity control in the building, and also insulate it so that energy costs are uh, less burdensome in the future. In addition, uh, there is about, there's a very substantial amount of additional work that we would like to uh, um, uh, continue uh, uh, beyond the initial uh, project. The project has been going on already for a year and a half, and it's likely to go on for another two years. This is really big stuff. And during most of that time, our roughly 25 museum staff members have been scattered in all different places doing their work. Some still in the cultural building as I've been until very recently, some working from home, some working from our storage facility in Hollowell, where I'm actually now located and where we've moved our offices. And uh, trying to pull this all together, work on collections, but particularly to work on moving objects from display and from storage to protect them and shift them and keep them out of the way of this massive construction project, which is uh, uh, obviously affecting all of this area is what our staff has mainly been involved in now for the last year. Uh, we think that something like roughly half of all staff hours have been devoted to this project. As you all know, we preserve the most um, uh, comprehensive a collection of main heritage materials that exists in the state and preserving it and protecting it and making sure it's available for the future is what we've been doing uh, in all of this time. I don't need to go into too many details about how disrupting this is, how difficult it is, but the staff has been wonderful cooperating uh, providing many examples of productive teamwork. And in the end, after all of this misery, we will have uh, created a much better museum building with many, many advantages. I've already mentioned, of course, there won't be any asbestos in the building, it will be safer. The climate control and humidity controls will be of a level uh, better than any we've had before. The building will be easier to operate. There are also many other additions because in addition to the cultural building, 
there are two other structures that I need to mention, and naturally this will be quite confusing, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, a lot of our storage, hundreds of thousands of objects, and most of our history and uh, archaeology collections are in a building we call the Annex in Hollowell, as I said, where I'm located at this moment. And in that building also a new HVAC system has been put in and uh, a new sprinkler system, which is required by code and new shelving requiring our collection staff to move things here, move them again and move them again. But this is already having a wonderful effect on the collection storage conditions that we have available and our ability to preserve these things uh, in perpetuity, which is in terms of collections objects, what we are uh, supposed to be uh, doing. And uh, after this year and a half of work, our staff has finally come back together in the annex building in Hollowell. I can see the faces of people that I have certainly not seen in reality for over a year. Uh, I certainly find that very gratifying. I have a couple of things to show you. Um, uh, we've done a lot of dismantling of the of exhibits in the uh, main museum building especially the exhibits on the third floor, our entrance floor, roughly 10,000 square feet of exhibits needing to be dismantled and protected and moved. And some of the objects uh, return to owners that uh, uh, have uh, given them to us many, many years ago. We uh, have a clip of what's going on. And many of you, of course, I hope all of you have been to the museum. You've seen what's on our third floor, mainly industrial things, sawmills, the great natural history uh, exhibit. This is all changing. And so I'm going to show you now just a couple of minutes of a clip of a very capable organization called Cody Crane, which actually installed some of these exhibits some 40 years ago, taking apart part of our granite exhibit. So I'm going to ask Amy to show this, but I'm not sure it's on the screen yet. Do you see that, Amy? Amy indicates that she is pulling it up. She's getting ready, but uh, these exhibits have to come out. I, I hadn't said that before, because none of this uh, involved work of asbestos remediation and replacing the whole heating and cooling system can occur while the exhibits are there. The contractors need to have access to different parts of the building, and they need to be able to work freely. So this is actually a big stone wagon, and uh, this is the kind of uh, wagon used in the 19th century in quarries to move huge blocks of stone. And we had to take this uh, part. Some of it is um, original, some of it is not. And there are other elements here, and you can see Cody Crane moving things around. The uh, part of the granite installation here actually comes from Vermont and not from Maine. And so taking it apart allowed us to return some of these items to the Vermont granite quarry from which they came 40 years ago. Many of our exhibits were well due for an overhaul in any case. And so the lemonade that we're making out of this lemon of all of this years of renovation is to provide us with uh, a spur to create new exhibits and new displays that we've wanted to do, but now is our chance to do it. And you can see what's uh, involved in some of this. This is very brief. This is all the granite quarrying exhibit. And you can see some of it uh, coming away. As I said, Cody Crane was the company that put in a lot of this material when the exhibits were first installed here almost 40 years ago. This, by the way, is a clip that was shown um, on channel six uh, there was a brief news story about what's going on uh, in the museum at the end of December, and I'm sure that some of you were able to see it at that time. So this is uh, uh, this clip is ending very shortly, but the uh, the wonderful outcome, as I've already suggested, of all this dislocation and hard work is uh, manifest in many ways. First, I'll just mention that work on the collections continues. You saw, of course, the, the wonderful, uh, remarkable Maine Women book uh, that Zach has just talked about. 
Um, hundreds of other objects have come into the collection, all requiring documentation and study. We've made a real effort to put more of our collection online. And if you check our website, you'll see uh, hundreds of new objects that have been put online with uh, substantial descriptions. And much of that is continuing. We're going to put another group of 150 online soon. We've also had a lot of new educational work mainly done online. And you can check the various programs that um, we have offered under our uh, lead educator, Joanna Toro, who's also here with us tonight. But these are projects that uh, have been for teacher training, for live presentation to classes, for other work with other organizations. The little clip that you saw was put together by Mandy Brown of the Education Division. And so we're learning a lot about online presentation and online work and reaching hundreds of people that way, even though we don't have a live audience. But one of the most exciting things that's going on is our ability to plan new exhibits. Now, many of our exhibits will remain familiar to you, but they'll be updated. They'll have new labels and new information. But that 10,000 square feet of exhibitry on the third floor is going to be completely wiped away and changed. And so now I'll call on Amy to uh, show us some of the plans that we've had drawn up to show how that process is coming along. And here you see a uh, floor plan of the third floor. That's roughly the 10,000 square feet. There's a legend on the left that shows some of these things. It'll be a little clearer to you when, you show, when we show you some three-dimensional images subsequently. But on the left of what you can see is our new education center, the Lunder Education Center that has been designed and is being designed specifically for families and students. And in the center, we have the Meet Main Here exhibit. And you see the Deer Ago sign there with the star. This will be an orientation exhibit that will include um, many aspects, different aspects of the main experience, uh, grouped around the themes of work, recreation, community, service, and innovation, concentrating on personal stories and giving you a very different view of Maine's history than what you got in past years with these large industrial machines. Now, many of our major objects like the, uh, uh, the Lombard in the back, uh, are staying, although they'll be offered new interpretations with updated information. The St. Mary is the uh, uh, brown area that's under 2E, and that will stay also with new interpretation. And those very uh, keen and attentive viewers who will have noticed that the Lion engine isn't in the picture. It is still in the picture, metaphorically. We're hoping to be able to move it out into the atrium into the lobby of the museum to provide more space for these exhibits. And on the right, this huge and wonderful exhibit of humpback whales, two humpback whales, a mother and calf, and parts of a right whale and other exhibitry will be on display. So uh, we're well in the process of Develop these, developing these exhibits. And now, Amy, I think we can go to the next scene, um, which just gives you a bit of a 3D presentation as you come into the museum with the reception desk on the right. Um, uh, looking into the Meat Main Here exhibit, that moose will come out of the existing natural history exhibits. And on the uh, right, and now we can look at the last image of the new exhibits give you a bit of a 3D presentation to give you a better spatial sense of what these sort of three large installations are going to look, uh, look like. Um, and uh, I should mention that the cost of this is very expensive. Uh, first of all, let me say that the whole cost of this renovation that the state is undertaking, uh, which uh, I'll remind you is taking at least three years to accomplish, involves three different agencies. So as big as the museum part of the project is, this is a much bigger project than just ourselves. But the whole cost of that is going to be in the range of $20 million over that three-year period. That's really quite remarkable. Um, and a lot of that is coming from the government ARPA funding that's been made available but others is coming from other aspect of uh, main state government um, resources 
as well as other directions. For the museum itself, this is our largest, as I've already mentioned, just in terms of square footage, but also our largest in terms of cost enterprise since we opened. It's going to cost us about $2 million to replace all of these exhibits. Now, if you actually do a square footage analysis, it's about $200 a square foot. Of course, that sounds like a lot, but it isn't really. If you were to look up in the internet what other museum displays and major museums uh, have cost, in keeping with Maine's legendary frugality, that's actually not a great deal of money. But we're going to make that go very far. We're going to stretch that money quite far. Again, that's over a roughly three or four year period for us. Uh, I have to say that Maine state government under the Mills administration has been generous to the museum and has contributed some money that's very important to help us with this exhibit development. Out of that $2 million, we still have to raise roughly $400,000 to complete the fundraising. But um, more than half of the money that I've mentioned has come from private sources, individuals, and foundations. So we really have a kind of state and public partnership to make this possible. Uh, doubtless, you're all wondering when we're going to open all these great new exhibits. And that, of course, depends on um, uh, how heaven looks upon us, because uh, a construction and renovation project of this magnitude has inevitable complications and delays. But we are hoping that we'll be able to reopen the museum, maybe on Statehood Day in March, of 2024. So that's our target. So, uh, you know, watch this space, as they used to say, and uh, lots will be happening. There'll be a great deal online for you to continue to see. Uh, many other things, uh, podcasts and presentations. We're also doing live presentations. So if any of you that is in person, if any of you would like to have, are connected with organizations that would like a presentation from the museum, just contact me or Joanna in the education department and we'll set something up for you. So there's really a lot going on and our staff is, if anything, overworked. So you don't have to fear that we sit around in our nice new offices. I think this is a grand office to have uh, uh, for the next two years or so before we go back to the uh, building, but we're not sitting in the offices with nothing to do. In fact, we're as busy as we could possibly be and we can't wait. Uh, for two years to pass of intensive activity to be able to show you what we're accomplishing in this period. So thank you all for listening. I hope I uh, gave you some idea of what's going on. I failed to mention, and we'll only briefly do that now, that third building, which is a building we call the Center Building, and that's part of the old Augusta Mental Health Institute complex, and that is being renovated by the Bureau of General Services for us as a storage facility for the larger and other objects we need to remove from the building and that we can't store in the Hollowell storage facility. We are hoping, I can't say we can be certain about this, but we're hoping that that will become a permanent storage facility for the museum because you know as, you know, if a shark, uh, not that we're sharks exactly, but if a shark can't keep moving, it dies. A museum that's a collecting institution has to keep collecting and that's, 3D space, despite the wonders of digitization and um, uh, online work and pixels, we're collecting substantial 3D objects that are part of Maine's really uh, indelible and we hope permanent history and we uh, have to have space for that. So that's gonna happen. So again, thank you all for attending. I don't know, Amy, if we have any uh, questions that I should respond to, but if you could, please let me know. I'm not seeing questions, but first, thank you so much for all that um, information and the inspiration. I think probably everybody who's participating in the call would um, join me in wanting to say hats off to the incredibly hardworking, resourceful staff. Um, they are um, realizing all of those exciting plans you're talking about. I would um, just say a couple of words to, to close us out. A few more words about the Friends as distinct from the wonderful museum. Um, the Friends is a private 501c3 cultural organization that does all it can to promote, draw attention to the museum and its resources um, through communications, 
like the Broadside print newsletter and the Museum Roundup and Museum Connections e-newsletters that some of you receive. Um, in, I'd say, sort of healthier times, we too would do more live events, sponsoring exhibit openings, lectures, um, and very enjoyable fundraising events. Um, for all of these, we um, rely on support from individuals, foundations, and corporations um, to do our work on the museum's behalf. So we thank you again for all of the forms of financial support and good company you've provided in the past and um, might again in the future. I, uh, at the start, added some links into the chat um, so that you could find um, places to engage further with the museum and the friends. And I added to it just now um, links to that news report that Bernard spoke about, uh, the New Center main piece about the museum closure. Um, and if I'm not seeing questions, um, you know where to find us. I will um, share that last screen. And apologies again, I, my um, state computer was wanting to restart in the middle of uh, everything that we were doing. And uh, so I kept sort of giving you things in wrong order. But um, on behalf of Linda Frisco, Bernard, Zach, our uh, wonderful participants from the critique group. I um, want to thank you all for joining us and hope you all will have a very pleasant evening. We'll hope to see you again soon. <laughs>